also mention my list of colleagues here who also um, contribute and direct this wider project. Um, so the site that I'm going to present today is Roman Silchester, uh, located here in the southeast of England. Um, this town started, began its origins um, <coughs> in the late Iron Age period, so about 20 BC. And the occupation on the site spans right into the sort of end of the Roman Empire in Britain um, through to the 5th century AD. And it's arguably um, a frontier town at its beginning and its end. Um, so a frontier in the terms of um, the um, Roman advance into Britain. Um, into the tribal territory of the Ethrobates, <coughs> and then um, at the end, where you have the sort of medieval, early medieval frontier. Um, so you have a frontier system of Wessex to the south and Mercia to the north. So there are two excavations um, at Silchester. The most recent one is Insula Three which I'm not going to talk about today, <laughs> um, because maybe the stuff I have from there is the late Roman, so that would be for another time. <laughs> um, what I am going to talk about is Insula 9, and I'm going to focus on one building, early Roman tomb of building 8. Um, this is a very exciting building, <laughs> which I will hopefully demonstrate. Um, and it spans quite a long chronological period. So it spans the time from AD 44, um, right the way through when the um, Iron Age buildings are built across by the Roman street grid, and also the first major building phase um, where buildings are built, these buildings here, but they don't conform to the Roman street grid. So this is a very good sort of case study to sort of look at issues of acculturation um, and also how people resisted Romanization. So I'm going to use a micromorphological approach to demonstrate how this building developed and was used and also how it sort of um, developed from an earlier building, which is called at the moment <laughs> Early Roman Timber Building 9. <laughs> this could change. Um, and then I'll say a bit about how the life of the inhabitants, what that was like in terms of the structuring of the internal space and the activities. So for anyone who doesn't know, um, this is how soil micromorphology samples are collected. Um, you can't always use a tin, sometimes you have to cut and wrap. <laughs> um, and normally they're collected from section faces, um, often in the case of particularly the buildings at Silchester where you have an open area excavation, you often have to sort of cut down into the floor with a small working section as well. So you cut your blocks out, these are impregnated with resin uh, and chopped using geological saws mounted onto glass slides and then cut down and ground to a thickness of 30 microns, which is about as thick as a hair. And then they're looked at using the geological polarizing microscope um, in a range of magnifications from about times 24, 25 up to about six times 630. So when you do um, an analysis of your thin section, you're looking at the origin of the materials, so nice in situ, as if they were sort of intact in the field. Um, things like particle size, sorting, all that sort of thing. It tells you about how your deposit formed, how it was deposited. Um, so basically the origins and transport of your anthropogenic materials within there. And also what happened to it afterwards, so how it was altered um, during the post-impositional sta um, stages. So this is the matrix. 
of early Roman timber building eight. Um, this is developed digitally on the um, IADB, the Integrated Archaeological Database. So you can see this building has several phases, and this transition phase here, these are the beams. So each one of these boxes here um, is a set, so it has another matrix within it. So if you had the whole one up, it would sort of take up the entire room, <laughs> so it's been reduced. Um, so we have the beam slots here, and then the abandonment of the building here. So using micromorphology, I looked at how the building um, developed. Because the thing about these buildings, they have um, sort of earthen foundations, and often the doorway for these structures isn't visible. So you have a lot of sort of cutting of the stratigraphy <coughs> because the Victorians were there <laughs> and dug through looking for exciting masonry buildings um, from the later Roman period and of course truncated a lot of the earlier buildings um, as did a lot of the later building foundations. Um, but at the same time these produced good windows into the stratigraphy. So using micromorphology I looked at the deposits um, and was able to identify um, build-up of trample material within certain parts of the building and how these sort of trample deposits changed as the building sort of evolved and new floors were laid and new hearths were built. So by mapping the movement of the trample deposits, we were able to work out where the sort of doorway kept moving to, so how people entered the building. So you can see at the beginning here, we have the earliest trample deposit, and then this falls out of use. And then it sort of builds up here um, in the later phase of the building. And just to show you um, how it sort of fits into the sequence of the building, we have the trample here, these are the floors and then the latest trample here, just before it's abandoned. So, in order to identify um, these deposits, <laughs> um, I identified material that had sort of been deposited as a result of trampling. So in temperate environments, it's quite muddy, and as you can see by this guy's feet, <laughs> material collects on the bottom of people's feet, and when you go into these sort of um, earthen floor structures, these are actually quite hard. So you can see this is um, at the experimental site of Lyra. Um, this is my friend Nina, helping me take micromorphology samples. And the clay floor was so hard, we had to saw through it to collect the block. <laughs> so. Um, So it really does sort of form a surface that is, you know, as hard as some concrete, which allows the sort of sediment to be deposited like this and build up in lenses in what would be the doorway. <coughs> so the harder materials sort of embedded within it um, are quite still quite unoriented and randomly distributed, whereas all the softer materials um, become compressed and form nice sort of lenses. So in terms of the use of this building, um, we have various sort of use phases here. Um, this sample here is this one. Um, this is the floor, which comes about here. And on top of the floor are just like loads and loads of discard deposits. So this building was very poorly maintained. They didn't really clean it. Um, and this is a theme throughout the use of the building. Um, it was just sort of <laughs> deposits everywhere, um, discard deposits, so packed full of refuse, um, a lot of which was bone working, or, uh, the result of bone working or bone processing. Um, so both in the early phases of the building, so here, and in the later phases of the building as well. Just to show the location of some of the hearths within the building, the red blocks are hearths. 
Um, and there were many halves within this building. <laughs> um, so you can see here sort of highly sort of reddened sediment. And under the microscope, um, this is sort of loads and loads of micro laminations of burnt sediment and ash. So a lot of buildup of residues around the half. And this again is a theme that continues throughout the use of the building as well. So a very poorly maintained, quite industrious um, use of the building. And this is um, some slides of the deposits around the half. And you can see here all the micro lenses of ashes and decalcified ashes and bits of charcoal and burnt dung as well in this building. And again here. So this half um, had stayed in the same place for a while and built up over time. And the sort of dirty nature of this building is also supported by the geochemistry. So I don't know if you can see all the um, elements. This is phosphate. Um, this is early Roman timber building 8, so that's the alignment there. Um, this is timber building 8 here. And um, you can see very high phosphates um, compared to the other buildings. And also, we have this sort of dot here. And that was the half that I just showed you. This one here. Um, and it looks like there's been sort of, um, some sort of copper alloy working taking place on this half as well. <coughs> so moving on to the earlier phases of the building, um, this is what I'm starting to look at now. And we seem to have a glass blowing workshop earlier on. So continuing the sort of industrial use of the building, um, starting off with the glass blowing workshop. So we had a nice deposit of glass on, on, on top of which um, someone had dumped a load of very silica rich sand, highly fired sediment as well. So that's what we're investigating next. Um, just to sort of introduce early Roman timber building nine, this is the outline of eight. And this is what we have of nine. <laughs> so a few sort of stake holes and <laughs> post holes, really quite ephemeral in terms of what was there beforehand. However, we do have a matrix. <laughs> um, so the samples that I have Again, this one, this is the one from the glass blowing workshop, but the deposits at the bottom also span into early Roman timber building nine. And what we do know is we have, again, um, halves with very high um, temperature burning taking place. So it seems that we have an industrial um, use of the building starting in, it very, in its very early stages. So just to conclude, um, in terms of the use of the building, this is a very poorly maintained building, residues built up, and they were allowed to build up, um, particularly in comparison to some of the other buildings that were very clean. Um, the building seems to have an industrial um, and craft use um, throughout its life. There are halves with very high temperature burning, um, and this is supported in the geochemistry. So it seems to have not been used as a living space. Um, it seems that we have, um, it's certainly in this area of the town, a separation between the industrial activity and the domestic activity. And this building continues to be entered um, on the same side throughout its modifications which is demonstrated by the micromorphology. And in terms of sort of conformity to romanization or acculturation, um, even though the building doesn't align with the Roman street grid, unlike some of the other buildings in Insula 9 that tend to be sort of single um, room structures with central halves, even though they're rectangular, they seem to be sort of... Um, 
harking back to the Iron Age in terms of how the roundhouses were used with the central hearths, but we don't see this with this building. This building seems to be taking on more of a commercial use and making use of the Roman street. Thank you.